been waiting, excited, and uh, ready to worship the Lord with you tonight. Amen. Uh, I like that a lot. I know a lot of many, uh, a lot of pulpits put a little plaque up here inside the uh, where you lay your, your Bible, and it says, "Sir, we would see Jesus." Amen. And so we've come to meet with Him tonight. And let's bless Him. And let's begin tonight by turning to hymn number sixty-six. Hymn number sixty-six. As we continue our revival here at Burns Baptist Church, Pastor Daryl Weaver, amen, excited to hear what God has on his heart. Let's stand, stand and sing this together at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Oh, oh, oh. 
tried to pay, but when I looked ahead and saw such pain and woe, I said that I would settle. I settled it long ago, long ago, got on my knees long ago, I settled it all. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. Hallelujah! And the record's clear today, glory washed my sins away. When the old account was settled long ago, when in that happy home, my Savior's home above, I'll sing redemption story and praise Him for His love.
Instead of looking to the Savior, basking in the sunshine of His love, we ought to be rejoicing tonight. Uh, life is worth living. Why? Just because He lives. Yes. Amen. It's worth it all. all. All the hardship, every difficulty we face is all worth it. Why? Because you have a Savior in heaven that walked this earth for 33 years just to pay your sin debt. Just so that you could be set free. And so this life is worth living in spite of its heartaches, its hardships, and all the challenges that we face. We need to thank the Lord, amen, that this life isn't about us any longer, but it's all about Him, amen. So let's worship Him. 
Let's get excited about what we experience because of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let's pray and ask for the blessing tonight. And uh, Brother Ronaldo, if you pray for us.
listen, listen, listen. Hallelujah. He's a friend. A friend is closer than a brother. Oh, this friend, I will rely to be my strength as life goes on. Issues, and I'm not dealing so much in that realm tonight. But looking in chapter 7 and verse number 29. For this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not. And they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. Mm -hmm. As our reading for tonight, I pray that you greatly bless in the word. Lord, give us understanding. May we be doers. God, uh, may the need of every heart and life be met tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And we have an introduction. My, my text really is these words, the time is short. The time is short. That's what we're going to focus on tonight. I want to elaborate on these words that follow that both they which have, have wives be as though they had none. That does not mean that a man shall leave his wife, but that the dearest relationship on earth should not come between you and God and should not in any way deter you from serving the Almighty. Thank God for your marriage and make good out of your marriage, but still the Bible says we're to seek the kingdom of God First in his righteousness. Amen. And they that weep as though they wept not, we've all had our fellow of tears along life journey. I've met people that have experienced some sorrows that they let stop them from serving God. They've experienced some heartbreaks they never could get over. You know, if you will we'll allow God to give you grace, he'll bring you through the most devastating times of your life. Yes, sir. And you can go on and serve God. Amen. But they that um, weep as though they wept not. And then here's another 
category, they that rejoice as though they rejoice not. Thank God for good times in this life, but we should not let good times come between us and the Lord. There's more to life than parties. Amen. There's more to life than another playground, a play toy. There's more to life than the pleasures of this world. And they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and then they that buy as though they possess not. That's probably one of the greatest uh, problems in our day is materialism. Materialism has really uh, drawn a lot of people away from God. They put their focus on obtaining the things of this world, but we better take what the Bible says here. They that buy as though they possess not. You know, in reality, you know, thank God that he's blessed us with some good things, Amen. but just like this guitar I have, it's a tremendous good guitar, but you know what? It's not, it's not just mine to use the way I want to. It belongs to God, yeah. and I'm to honor oh. Him with that. Amen. My children never heard me play honky-tonk music mm -hmm. on the piano or the guitar because whether I'm at home or whether I'm in church, my music is God's music Amen. and Christ-honoring music. Yeah. And they that use this world as not abusing it for the fashion of this world passeth away. Now the time is short. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 16, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. But we better redeem the time. A lot of people waste in time. We live in a nation that seems like it's all right to waste time, to throw your time away. But now, let me tell you something, you can never get it back. You can never, once you waste your time, you cannot recover. However, the Bible says we can redeem the time. Uh, I don't know how much, a, a song written some years ago says, wasted years. Oh, how, sorry, I'm not sure how the lyrics of it, but wasted years. Mm -hmm. And I believe we could all identify with some wasted years. But the Bible says we're to redeem the time. One way you can redeem and make up for lost time is start a good prayer life. Start a good prayer life and, and start uh, double timing on serving God and, mm -hmm. and giving like you've never given before. Redeeming the time for the days are evil. In the book of John chapter 9 verse 41, Jesus said here, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when man, oh, when no man can work. Night is coming. God has given us a long day. We've had plenty of opportunity to do things, to make decisions, to go places. But guess what? It's going to all be over. The way things are looking in this world, in this day, brother, we are on. on the very verge of the coming of the Lord. Yeah. If you're going to do anything for the glory of God, you better get to it because the day is about to cease. The night cometh when no man can work. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do Do it with thy might For there is no work nor device Nor knowledge nor wisdom In the grave whither thou goest I remember a camp meeting up in Homosassa Springs, Florida Which I attended and took part in all their camp meetings uh, That covered a span of many years and I remember one particular occasion, a blind lady got up to sing a cappella, and she sang a song I never have got over. It's not, and I'm sure you probably heard the song, but the way she sang it, you know, it's different when God's on it. Amen. And boy, God was all over that lady. And she sang this song, very, very simple, but she sang, when I look into his beautiful face, something like that, I wish I had given him more more so much more and we're going to be standing before judgment one day and we're going to be able to think about that very thing right. I oh. wish I had done more I wish you cannot go back and relive your life amen, right. amen. there's only one time around there's only one chance that you can do anything amen. and you better get down to business amen. You're not going to always have opportunity to be saved if you're not saved. You better get with it tonight 
and give your life to the Lord while there is opportunity, while there is time. The Bible says, call it to him when he is when he is near and seek him, seek him while he may be found. This life will soon be passed. One writer said, "'Tis only one life will soon be passed, and only what you do for Christ will last. Quit daydreaming, quit procrastinating. All opportunities will be gone. Get some things done while you can. There are some things you can do now and this while you have this time God's given you. Just get started doing the things you know that are right. It's so easy to procrastinate. So easy. I'm going to do this. You know what? The devil never gets worried on what you're going to do tomorrow. Yeah. Right. Come on. <clears throat> I heard somebody say years ago that today is God's word. Tomorrow is the devil's word. Mm -hmm. Moses went before Pharaoh time and time again. Pharaoh said, tomorrow I'll do whatever, you know, to get right to do. Anyway, tomorrow, tomorrow. But God says today is the day of salvation. Amen. Right. Now is the accepted time. But you, you, you better quit putting it off. You better quit procrastinating. We don't know tomorrow any of us in here could already have drawn our last breath. You're not too young to die. Right. <clears throat> You're not too healthy to die. I remember reading about a guy that had written a book on the value of jogging. He was, a, if there's such a thing as a professional jogger, he was, and he wrote a book to that effect. And this same guy, while he was out jogging, had a massive heart attack, fell over dead. So you better not, the Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow. Amen? Yeah, boast not thyself of tomorrow. So thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. We just went to the cemetery yesterday <clears throat> off Sunrise Boulevard, Avenue, whatever it's called. That's where my wife's parents are buried. She's got some other siblings out there, some other kindred out there. Anyway, we've been out there a couple times putting some flowers out. A lot of graves out there. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if you, and I don't, I'm not, you know, don't go around, but I have walked through graveyards before <laughs> reading the, the, the tombstones, epitaph on the tombstones and, and reading the dates. You know, there's a grave out there with a corpse in it that's got your birthday on it. Right. Yeah. Somebody that was born the same day you were, maybe even the same hour, they're already buried six feet under. You're not promised tomorrow. Right. I have this little poem. I'm not going to read it right now. I don't think I read it here before, and I'm not. I can't rehearse it. I'm not going to bring it up. But it speaks about the dash, the dash on the tombstone, and uh, it says, you know, the beginning, the date here, and then the end, and the date there. But that little dash in the middle tells the whole story of your life. Amen. What have you done with your dash? And your life is nothing but a dash. The life is going to end oh so soon. It's amazing how quickly time gets by. Right. It's amazing. Preacher, how many years have you been in this particular facility? I mean, not right here, but in Port St. Lucie? Uh, about 10 years, I guess. I was thinking about yeah. that. Just seemed like yesterday. Yeah. Time gets by so quickly. Just seemed like yesterday, all you older people, seemed like yesterday we were in grade school. Of course, I spent 20 years in grade school. Just, just seemed like yesterday we were in grade school and high school, and it seemed like it never end. If you had some mean teachers like I did, you'd have thought the same thing. Amen. Amen. But now let me get to my points tonight. The time is short. Time is running out. Number one, to call upon the name of the Lord. Let me ask you something. It's a powerful question. Very needful question. Something to ponder and something to act upon. Do you have a prayer life? I didn't ask you, you say you're a blessing. Religion will make you do that kind of stuff. And you say, now I'll lay me down to sleep. I'll forget that stuff. Do you pray? 
Do you really pray? Have you ever really prayed? I mean prayed with passion, with a hot heart. Praying, not worrying so much about the vocabulary, trying to impress God with your religious right. wording. I mean, have you ever got desperate for God? Have you ever got the O in your prayers? Mm. The what? The O. Uh -oh. O! Yeah. Oh! Oh, God! Yeah. Yeah. Brother, we better get desperate. Come on. You need to pray. If you're not praying, the devil has no, you, you don't make him nervous one bit. No matter how much religious stuff you do otherwise, if you're not, the, the people that the devil worries the most about would be God's praying people. Amen. The devil does not worry about a church that doesn't pray. Is it important for a church to be a, a praying church? The Lord himself said, My house shall be called the house of, you know it, the house of, say it, the house of prayer. prayer. Not the house of music, not even the house of preaching, but the house of prayer. This revival will be no greater than your prayers. Amen. Brother, I, I'm not here to preach up revival. I cannot preach it up. Right. I cannot preach it down. It's not a matter of having a pep rally. It's not a matter of having some good times. It's a matter of meeting with God. It's a matter of an outcome yeah. of the Holy Ghost. I'm yeah. telling you, God is willing to give revival, yeah. but he, must, he has to walk. There, there needs to be some people that want revival. Yeah. He's not going to make it happen. Yes, yeah. Do you want revival? Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah. Lord, yeah. send revival yeah. and let it begin yeah. in oh, me. Yeah. I'm yeah. tired of my deadbeat life. I'm tired of my cold-hearted religion. I'm tired of the plastic scenario thing. Dear God, I want the fire, the power of God yeah. on my life. I want to feel the touch yeah. of God again. I want your presence in my life. I want your spirit to flood my soul. Yeah. Oh God, send revival. You need, you need to pray. You, everybody, whether you're lost or whether you say, this church needs to pray. Amen. We need yeah. to get some prayer warriors. The greatest, the greatest asset of your church is prayer warriors. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's good. <clears throat> your family needs prayer. Yes. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I don't want you to raise your hand. I just want you to think, how many of you have lost wayward family members that's maybe in the very grip of hell right now? <clears throat> they have <clears throat> no time for church. They have no time for the Bible, no time for prayer, no time, and they detest religion altogether. Mm. Want nothing to do with God. They're too busy trying to make money, trying to have fun. <coughs> your family, the greatest asset of your family is having a praying mama, a praying daddy, Amen. praying siblings. Come on. <coughs> Just the other day I told the story about a man by the name of Hobo Jackson. He's dead now. I knew him. Not real well. There's a church up in Macon, Georgia, or Gray, Georgia, which is close to Macon. It was actually named after him called Jackson Memorial Baptist Church. But Hobo Jackson, John is his real name, but we know him as Hobo, <clears throat> was raised in southwest Georgia around Cairo, if I remember right. John ran away from home. When he was 12 years old, yeah, 12 years old, I don't mean he went two blocks and hid behind some bushes and got hung and came home. No, no, no. John Jackson caught a freight train, wound, he went all the way to Houston, Texas, mm -hmm. and never, mom and daddy never heard from him until he was grown. I think he was 21 years old. What happened, John, Hobo Jackson, that's why they call him Hobo. He was a hobo. But uh, he was in Houston, Texas. <clears throat> oh, yeah. And conviction of God got a hold of him. Amen. The conviction power. You'll never get saved outside of conviction. Right. Amen. That's 
Right. It's not just repeat after me thing. John Jackson fell under the spirit, the, the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. And John falls on his knees, but in the alleyway, a muddy alley, it was raining. He falls on his knees in that muddy alleyway, and God saves him right there. Amen. He goes into the store, has to be used the phone. Back in those days, it cost something to use a phone. They didn't have cell phones. It was a long distance, but once the owner realized this young man had given his life to God, he said, yes, son, you go ahead, you call home. So John calls home. Mama answers the phone. He says one word. Mama throws the phone down and starts shouting all over the house. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Why was Mama shouting? Because she had been praying. She had been praying. Do you want your loved ones saved? You better pray some conviction on them. And finally she came back and got the phone. And anyway, John became a powerful preacher. God used him all over the country. The time is short for praying. Yeah, yeah, you know you need to pray, but you don't ever take time. You just don't take time. So... In uh, Genesis 4, I'm not going to read much of it, but you find a lineage of, of um, the lost lineage, uh, the line of Cain. And it mentions each name, and it gives their trade, and then goes on to the next name. You go to Genesis 5, and you got the lineage of Seth. And there's something peculiarly different in Genesis 5 from Genesis 4, other than the names being different, there's a phrase that follows each name. It says, and he lived. He lived. He lived. He lived. You don't find that in Genesis 4. You give the name and what they did, and that's it. They existed in chapter 4, but they didn't really live. The chapter 5 lineage lived. Now, you got to get this. There's a verse that makes the difference. I call it the pivotal verse between those two chapters. It's the last verse of chapter 4. I'll, I'll read that to you. Genesis 4, verse 26. And the saith to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. Genesis 4, people did not pray. <laughs> But then at the last verse of Genesis 4, they started praying. Right. People started praying. Amen. They moved into Genesis 5, and he lived, he lived, he lived. I used to be a Genesis 4 man. Oh. I existed. I had a trade. The hallelujah, verse 26 took place in my life. I began calling. I began. I didn't say I said a prayer. I began calling Amen. upon the name of the Lord. And I moved into Genesis 5. And now, because he lives, but now I live. Thank God I got a life worth the living. Yes, sir. Because he lives, life is worth the living. Amen. The time is short. A birthmark of salvation is prayer. You see this illustrated in the book of Acts chapter 9, verse 11. And here the Lord is speaking. The Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Now this is what God says, For behold, he... I'm going to stop right there for a moment. Get a point across. Okay, the man... Saul, God is working his life, saving his soul. And God says, Behold, he believeth no. Behold, he repenteth no. What was God's assessment? Behold, he prayeth. Behold, he prayeth. And that ETH, the Bible students know, 
That means it's ongoing. It didn't, it didn't say, behold, he prayed the prayer. He prayed. I believe a, a true mark that you've been saved is you didn't just say a prayer, you still pray. Amen. You still pray. You're a prayer. You're a prayer. Number two, time is running out. The time is short to search the scriptures. I meet Baptists all the time. They've had a Bible for years and years. 20 years, 30 years, the outside of the book is still gold. The pages are stuck together. Why? Oh, we want to preserve it, make it, you know. God didn't give you a Bible as a relic. Amen? Right. Every Bible needs to be read. I don't mean read like that. I'm talking about read like that. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Your, your Bible is not to make you look religious. If you've got a, an unread Bible, you ought to be ashamed. Come on. And you might have more than one Bible. I'm saying you need to have a Bible that just say, that's my Bible and I read my Bible. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Your faith life will never outgrow your Bible life. You will never be a better Christian than what your Bible life is. Amen. Yep. The Lord and the book of Peter says we're to grow. 2 Peter 3, 18, I think. But grow. But grow in the grace and knowledge. How can you? How can you? You cannot grow in grace. This book is the book of grace. How can you grow in grace if you don't on. feed on grace? <laughs> How can you grow in the knowledge if you never read the book? Amen. You say you want to be a better Christian? No, you don't. Not if you're not in the Bible. Right. You're fooling yourself. Amen. Brother, we better Amen. become Bible students. Amen. Not just a verse a day to keep the devil away because it won't. Brother, you're to be a serious Bible student. Yeah. No matter how old or young, no matter how long you've been saved, if you're a new convert, you're to be a Bible student. Amen. Get into the Bible. Search the Scriptures. Isaiah 34, verse 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. And then another verse I quote every day of my life is Joshua 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. God wants you to be a Bible Christian. Amen? A Bible Christian. Are you a Bible Christian? I'm going to tell you what, you better get into the Bible if you're ever going to know doctrine. Doctrine is vital. Doctrine is major. Doctrine is so important in your life. And if you don't get in your Bible, you're going to have somebody knock on your door by the name of Jehovah's Witnesses and snowball you. Right, right. You say, they don't have snowballs in Florida. They got them. Anyone will say it. They'll, they'll get you so drowned. They'll, they'll pull the wool over your eyes. You, don't, you, you cannot refute them. And I've had some encounters with Jehovah's Witnesses. When I pastored in Okeechobee years ago, I had... Um, had a good church over there, there for about nine years. One evening, a 14-year-old boy called me. His family belonged to our church. He said, Pastor, said, um, Daddy was gone. He, Mom was there and some siblings. He said, a Jehovah Witness, or two of them were there. I said, okay, Robbie, I'll just name. He said, I'll be over pretty soon. I went right on over there. Went in, sat down, and, and this was a very learned man. He was a black man, very educated in the scriptures of the Jehovah's Witness doctrine. And um, he was running some time, just let him go for a little bit. And I was getting some scriptures ready. And I'm going to try to tell you the things he was teaching that evening. But one thing that he did drive majorly was that this right here, this body is the same as the soul. They don't believe in a separate soul. They believe the body is the soul. 
And he went through some illustrations about that. So I finally had turn to take the floor. I went to some scriptures about uh, fear not him that, uh, uh, how does it go, fear, but, but cast a both body and soul separate mm -hmm. into hell. And I gave him different verses, which he, it didn't really affect him that much. But finally, I got to Revelation chapter 6, where it speaks about the heads were severed of and souls crying out from under the altar. These saints, they had been killed, but their souls were still crying out from under the altar. Mm -hmm. And he could not handle that. He, that blew him out of the water right there. So at that point, I instructed that dear lady. I said, you need to ask these men, according to the book of uh, 1 John or 2 John, to leave your house. Give not God speed to these people. You don't allow them. I'm telling you that tonight. Amen. You give no place to allow these Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons into your house. You can witness. I've witnessed to them in the parking lot. I've witnessed to them in the restaurants. But I'm saying you better not accommodate them. Right. And give any ear to their doctrine because they do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. Not at all. They do not believe that Jesus Christ was actually God. Another thing, they do not believe in a bodily resurrection. Oh, they'll say, well, we believe in a resurrection. Get them to explain what they believe about the resurrection. They believe in a sort of a spiritual resurrection. They think Jesus is still in the grave. Let me tell you something. I serve a risen Savior. Yeah. You got that? Amen. Amen. I serve a risen Savior. He lives. Hallelujah. He lives. Amen. Thank God. I don't, I don't serve a dead Savior, and I don't have a dead religion. Right. Search the scriptures in order to get to know God, in order to know the way of life, how to live your life, how to raise your children, how to get a, have a better marriage, and have victory in your life. Some of you live a chronic life of defeat. Yeah. You never have any victory, and you never have any joy bells. It's just mumbo jumbo, just nothing. Nothing to really delight your soul. No victory, no testimony. And so, number three, we're talking about the time is short. The time is short to get all the way into church. Don't be a hit and miss, somebody. And I know I'm talking to the faithful ones tonight. I guess I should have hit that one this morning. But get all the way into church. The Lord loved the church. Is that what the Bible says? He loved the church and what? Gave himself for it. If you love the church, you're going to give yourself. I know that's a different thing. He gave himself for it in terms of the death on the cross. But we're to give ourselves for the church in terms of being a blessing, serving the church, serving the Lord through the church. Uh, unto him, in Ephesians 3.21, unto him be glory. Where? Where? In the church. By Christ Jesus throughout all ages. The church is not going out of business. Right. You got that? Throughout all ages. Amen. Church is going on. Oh, there's a lot of enemies to the church in this day. The government is trying to shut the church down. They're using this pandemic trying to, it's okay to have a right, but you can't have church. Right. Come yeah. on. <clears throat> and I'm not going to get into all that, but man, we better make big of our church. I don't know if y'all missed any. Uh, gatherings during, I'm not saying the pandemic is over, but a lot of churches shut down, a lot of them still are shut down, we never shut down. Did y'all shut down any? I don't remember. Well, we still had some churches that made it live stream on. Right. Here. People were willing to, never right. told nobody to come. Right, Just right. let them feel comfortable coming when they were ready. Right, but you never, like, locked up. Uh, no. Right. And we never did either. We had a, you know, good percentage of our people coming on and we're, we're live streaming now. But the whole point is 
that, um, you know, you couldn't have over like 10 people, but yet at the funeral of that black guy, George, somebody that got shot, I mean, how many people showed up at that funeral? And no problem. I, don't, I didn't see one of them wear a mask. I don't know, they might have, but I didn't look for it. But I'm just saying, there was no social distancing and all that, the rioting, no social distancing, amen. And no problem, it's okay, but you try to have church. Uh, you better get all the way into church, make big out of your church life. Give your life to be a blessing to the church and uh, a, a giver, contributing to the ongoing and to the ministry of your church. Somebody said, well, you, you can't take your money with you. You ever heard that? I'll tell you this, you can send it on ahead by investing in the work of the Lord. And I know it's not money up there, but it's a whole lot better than money. Then number four, time is running out to get somebody in the church. Let me ask you something. Has God ever used you to get one person to Jesus Christ? Have you ever even spoke to a soul? And I don't mean you have a, a formal presentation. I'm not driving that. But I'm saying, have you ever told anybody what God's done in your life? Can they see Jesus in you? Has anybody ever been affected toward God as a result of meeting you and speaking to you? Have you ever given out one track? Have you ever invited anybody to come to the church? Time is running out. Get your family in to get friends, constituents, anybody, lost people in. And then my last point, time is running out to get involved in really serving God. Really serve. I remember when I pastored in Midville, Georgia, which you probably don't know where it is, and I don't blame you. Uh, you have to have a magnifying glass to find it on the map. But anyway, I pastored there for some years. And it was uh, before we went on the road. That's when, of course, wife, three children, all my children were home. <clears throat> we we'd already started singing together. And God put it on my heart. And we began praying as a family. And we did so for a whole year about going to evangelism. And it was impressed on my heart, if you're ever going to do anything with your family, you better do it. Because those kids grow up fast. Yeah. Grow up fast. And so we, we went on the road with no promise of anything. God put us out there for 24, 25 years. And my children still love and serve God to this day. If you're ever going to serve God, <coughs> do it. You hear me? Do it. Don't just talk about it. Don't just dream about it. Don't just think about it. I'm one day, one day, one day. No, no, do it. Time is running out. Do what you can do. You say, well, I, you know, I, let me just read some of these alibis. Well, if I had a good education, no. Who were God's disciples? They were fishermen. They were not college graduates. They were fishermen. Now, they got a lot of good education somehow, but, but still, God uses your availability more than your ability. Right. Come on. Well, if I had money, then no. Remember the widow that is cast in two mites? And the Lord says she is cast in the treasury more than all the rest of them because she cast in all her living. The little boy that was among the multitude of 5,000 families and nobody had anything to eat but the little boy, what did he have? Uh, two fishes and five loaves of bread, which were like biscuits. We think of a loaf like that, but no, the tomato looked like a biscuit thing. 
What did Jesus use to feed those that hungry multitude? Tell me, what did he use? He used the little boy's lunch. Oh, it wasn't much there, but it doesn't take much. Amen. The Lord can take what little bit you have. And I don't mean, I'm just talking about whatever you have in your life, talents or whatever abilities you have, God will take it and use it if you will be like the little boy, put it in his hands. Amen. Just let him take it and do with it what he wants. Well, if I had a talent, you do have a talent of some type or another. If I had a better personality, if I was younger, you're not too old to serve God. Uh, if I had the right connections, open doors, and just excuse after excuse, if I had better health. Now, do y'all know where I'm staying this week? You know. How many of you know anything about Bethel Baptist Church in Amen. Fort Pierce? Yeah. All of you know about it? Do y'all know about it? It's a very large church in terms of size. It's on McNeil Road. Nice guest facility. They run a meager few now. They might not have as many there tonight as what we do here. But that church began in my wife's home when she was a young teenager. And that church grew amazingly. It grew while I was in the house. They started running, how many want about seven in your house? Wow. Wiley Wooten was the founding pastor. And um, so they bought uh, some property and built a small building. Her mom. Now, she, she was crippled, more crippled than I am, bedridden the time I knew her, maybe a wheelchair at least. But her name was Mama Lee. Everybody knew her as Mama Lee. No education. Nothing fancy about Mama Lee. She was just a country as cornbread. <laughs> but uh, Mama Lee... Oh, brother, that church grew. If Wiley Wooten could be here, of course, he's dead now. Right. If he could tell you a major factor about that church growing, he would say it's Mama Lee. Mama Lee. She couldn't get out and go about, but she would use that phone. On special days, she would call, she would call the dignitaries, the councilmen, and so forth, and the sheriff's office. She'd say, I want you to come and hear my preacher. And if she ever dialed the phone back then, rotary dialed. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if she got the wrong number, she said, oh, it's not the wrong number. God wanted to call you. And, and uh, she got a lot of people to come to church. She got a lot of people. There was one man who was Wiley's nephew. He was a redneck, beer drinking, <laughs> hunting somebody. He was a builder, still is a builder. But uh, his name was Rusty, Rusty Wooten. They know him as Russell now. But Rusty Wooten, working on the house where my wife, her family lived, and uh, Mama Lee, man, she, boy, she had boldness about her, but it was a sweet boldness. It was not a arrogant, uh, pushy sort of a thing. But she had talked to Rusty, Rusty's son, won't you come to my church, our church? I'm not sure how she said it, but just that sweet approach and you just couldn't say no. So sure enough, Rusty showed up, and you can take it from there. Rusty got saved. Yeah. And now Rusty is pastoring about 30 miles from where I'm pastoring there in Georgia. And so, uh, you know, if, if she could have used excuses, but no, she didn't. What excuse are you using tonight that you're not serving God? So anyway, we want to get her music. You'll come up. Yeah. Lord, may we really get a hold of this truth that the time is short.